Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. In this video, I'm going to be talking about Musa Adnan, who has done a review on my debate where I had a chat with Sneeko, and I told him that there isn't actually just one Quran, there's actually multiple Qurans and at least 10. Sneeko had never heard of this, despite the fact that he has been a Muslim for almost a year now, and has consistently been in touch with some of the biggest names in Dawah, and yet somehow he had never heard of the Qur'at, which I find quite interesting, and neither has he heard of the Aruf, which is the different modes that the Qur'an is recited in. This has kind of exploded on uh, on Twitter, it has over 200,000 views, and Muslims are sort of panicking to respond to this because they need to lie continuously to the Ummah in order for them to keep believing that the Qur'an has been perfectly preserved and there's only one Qur'an. And they're coming up with some really innovative ways of doing it. Let's first watch the part of the clip where Musa Adnan tells me exactly what I got wrong in the video. What, what mistakes did I make? Let's listen to what he has to say. First of all, I want to just quickly mention about the Qira'at. The Qira'at are different ways of reciting the Qur'an. Tonight, it's Ramadan. Tonight, in various masajid in London, I would not be surprised. You're going to be hearing different, actually tonight in various parts of the globe. We read the different qira'at, the different riwayat in our salah. Why are you coming to us like it's a surprise? That's why it's very disingenuous of you to go up to a new Muslim because you know he's probably not going to be familiar with this because he's a new Muslim. We hear the qira'at all the time, the riwayat of the Qur'an, we hear them all the time. And it's all one Qur'an. Why is it all one Qur'an now? Someone's going to come and say, Musa, prove it. Well, guess what? At the very time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Companions were reading in different ways. Companions were reading in different qira'at, in different ways. We have the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, where Hisham ibn Hakim was reading in a certain way, and Umar radiallahu anhu was reading Surah Furqan in a certain way. And guess what? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith in Bukhari says, كَذَلِكَ أُنزِلَتْ كَذَلِكَ أُنزِلَتْ it was revealed like this, it was revealed like this. I.e. this is all of the Qur'an. Please understand, we have reference of the Prophet telling us this. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, so he's giving the same old, same old Dao script and it's getting tiring at this point. Every da'i pretty much who's aware of this issue is they basically just say, look, um, it's all Qur'an. They're not contradictory meanings. Don't bother about it. Don't look at it. Don't read a book. Just accept what we tell you. And I'm telling Muslims, don't. Be honest. Look at your own sources. Look at things that inst Dawa Institutes put out there and read it for yourself. So the first thing I want to show you are some sections of the book that I was telling Sneeko about. I said to Sneeko, there's a book you should read. That book is the Bridges Translation of the Ten Kala'at of the Noble Quran. You can even get an app on your phone, because they were, they were handy enough to release an app, which I highly recommend, by the way. It's actually a, a good app, and it helps when you're talking to Muslims and you want to show them this quickly. They used to have it on Quran.com as an English translation, but they've since removed this, presumably because I've been talking about it too much. And now they're like, oof, can't let the Ummah know that there were these variants, these particularly substantial variants. So they cut it off. That's that's my theory anyway. But uh, yeah, let's read what... Fidel Suleiman and his team, and his team, by the way, I'll show you now, are these guys, because he actually says in the book who is responsible for producing this piece of work where he translates the ten kalat, the ten different readings or recitations of the Quran. Here they are. You can see quite a few doctors and imams. Yeah, seems like a pretty decent team. So we read in the section, the ten kalat of the Quran. Bridges translation of the ten kalat or modes of recitation is the first translation, breaking new ground, to embrace the ten modes of recitation. Only the variations which affect the meaning were considered. Wait, what? There are variations which affect the meaning? I thought it was just dialects and accents. Huh. It's almost as if someone's been lying to me. While the dialectical variations were not pointed out, since they would naturally have the same meaning. Right, so the ones that ultimately don't change the meaning, he wouldn't include. But the ones that do change the meaning, which he affirms there are, he will include. Thank you, Fadal Salimam. It is very important for the reader to know that although in some instances he slash she may find a considerable difference in the meaning and sentence structure in English, the Arabic variations are usually extremely slight. Most of the time a mere diacritical mark. Now, what he's saying here is a simple change of diacritical mark can have a substantial effect in the actual meaning. So that when you translate it into English, 
it can result in inclusion of new words or removal of words or even completely different words. It depends on where you put diacritical marks because the diacritical marks are, finalizes the letter that you're using. Without the diacritical marks, there are Arabic letters that you wouldn't know what they mean. You know, you have ba, ta, tha. Where the diacritical marks are make a big difference in what letters you're using. And the letters obviously determine the word. So in the section called About Bridges Translation of the Ten Qur'at of the Holy Quran, he says the following. It is the first translation that includes the Ten Qur'at, the modes of recitation. Note he uses the term modes. He doesn't say the dialects. The main text is written in accordance with the most commonly used Qur'at, that of Asim, narrated by Hafs. Variations that are presented in footnotes denoted by Q. The translation presents around 30% of the variations of the Qur'at, those which affect the meaning and can therefore be demonstrated in translation. 30% of the Qur'at, according to Fadel Soleiman and his team, affect the meaning and can actually be shown in translation. That is what he has done in his work, the Bridges translation of the Ten Qur'at of the Noble Qur'an. So what are these different meanings? What are these variants? Let's let's take a look. For example, in the first one, in Surah Al-Maidah, so Surah 5, Ayah 6, we read, O you who have attained faith, when you rise for prayer, wash your faces and your hands up to your elbows, and wipe your heads and wash your feet to the ankles. That is the Hafs reading, one of the ten different Qur'at. There's a footnote, and every time in his book there are words in red, by the way, that means there's a variant reading in the different Qur'at. If you're on the app, you can actually tap that red text and it will immediately tell you at the bottom what the different ones are. If you have his work either in book form or PDF, he'll actually include it in the footnotes at the bottom of the page. So for the footnote for that, he says, all except Nafi, Ibn Amir, Hafs, al Qasai, and Yaqub read it as wash your faces and your hands up to the elbows and wipe your heads and your feet to the ankles. You'll notice there's a word missing there. In the original translation, we had and wash your feet to the ankles. But in here he's saying, well, actually there are different variants where they don't even have the word wash, which changes the actual meaning of the sentence. Instead of being told you are to wipe your heads and wash your feet, you're now being told to wipe your head and your feet. So do you wash your feet or do you wipe them? Depends which killer art you read. And of course, the words wash and wipe have different understandings and different meanings. You could say that wash includes everything that wipe does, but wipe does not include everything that wash does. So in other words, you can't reconcile them. They are two different things. Hence, they are contradictory meanings because they cannot be both true at the same time. Again, wipe does inc include everything wash does, but wash does include everything wipe does. Let's move on. Let's go to Surah 37, Ayah 12, where we read, Indeed, we created them from sticky clay. Rather, you were amazed as they ridicule. Huh, okay. So this is Allah talking about the process by which he created human beings, namely from sticky clay. And then says, rather, you, meaning someone who's not Allah, were amazed as they ridicule. Interesting. Let's see what the footnote says. Because again, there's red text, which means that there's a variant there. Hamza, al Qasai, and Kalaf read it as, Rather, I gravely noted as they ridicule. Wait a second. That is a very different sentence than the one we read before. In fact, if you if you didn't tell me, I would have thought it's a totally different verse. But it's not. It's the same verse, but with just a different meaning. So we read in the first one, it was rather you, in other words, not Allah, who is the one speaking here, were amazed as they ridicule. So it's about people being amazed, and it's about someone other than Allah being amazed. Now, it's Allah talking about himself, because notice the word you has now changed to I. So rather, I gravely, no gravely noted. That's nothing like amazed. Being amazed and being gravely noted are two completely different things. They're not even related. <laughs> in this single sentence, the subject changes. It goes from being Allah in one color art to someone else in another color art. And what they did changes. So you have... They were amazed, and you have, they gravely noted. You have two contradictory meanings in a single sentence. First of all, who's speaking? Well, depends what Kirat you read, because it changes who's speaking. How would you say that these contradictory meanings somehow bring out more of a single meaning in the Quran? It, it can't. It has different meanings completely. Can they be reconciled? I don't think so. Unless you want to say that Allah is basically revealing things by just rewriting a verse. But if Allah wanted to say both these meanings at the same time, that you were amazed and I gravely noted, wouldn't you just write two different verses? Why would you, in effect, overwrite one 
with another totally different meaning. They don't add to the meaning at all of each other. They actually say totally different things. In biblical scholarship, we call this a variant. So just so you know, Muslims, you have variants just like Christians do. There's no sort of magic Quran preservation going on here. This is why Muslims have to come up with, oh, they all go back, Muhammad said them all, even though there's not a single narration that says that Muhammad narrated differences in the Quran, the recitation, in ten different ways. I challenge you to find me that. Okay, let's go to the Surah of Jonah, Surah 10, Ayah 16. Say, had Allah willed, I would not have read it to you, and he would not have informed you about it. Okay, so Allah would not have informed them about something. Okay, all good. Al-Bazi, in one of his narrations, read it as, and he would have informed you about it. So, you have a different Qur'at which just contradicts the meaning. <laughs> There's something called logic gates. So in effect, with logical statements, you could say conditionals. If you have someone saying something is, and then you add the word not, you negate it. It's literally the opposite. So to say he would tell you something, or he would have informed you, and then to change it to he would not have informed you, that is a negation. It is literally negating what the other Qur'at said. So again, how do you reconcile that? And why would have Allah revealed something where he tells you something and then also tells you the exact opposite in a different recitation? These are just some of the differences you can find. And if you scroll through PDF or you get the app of the British translation of the Ten Qur'at of the Noble Qur'an, you'll find these everywhere. In fact, there are tons and tons and tons of red text in his book because there's just so many variants. And don't get me wrong, some of them are very mild, absolutely. I think some of them can be reconciled, if not most of them. But there are also those that cannot be reconciled. That's my point. And if they cannot be reconciled, you have to say that there is, in fact, ten different Qurans. It just depends on which recitation you're reading. If you don't like that, then you're just doing theological loop-de-loops to get out of the conclusion that you have different Qurans. So if there are contradictory meanings in the Qur'at, in some instances, what does that mean? Well, because your history tells you that all of these are valid recitations, then you have to also conclude that there are multiple Qurans. There are multiple recitations, because Allah revealed it this way. I mean, your traditions tell you that there should indeed be different recitations of the Qur'an that are valid, that Muhammad did indeed approve, and did indeed tell people. He did say these different meanings. Muhammad would apparently say, in one instance, that Allah, quoting Allah, he did indeed inform people of something, and then in another instance he said, in the same place, in the same context, that he did not inform them of something. I find that quite problematic if you were to hold to the doctrine of perfect preservation, because that isn't perfect. If it was perfect, you wouldn't have contradictory meanings. You would have a single unified recitation, but you don't have that. Read these things, because I've given you examples now. You can go and you can read these and you can even find more if you want to. But if there are these different meanings, you cannot say to people that they have been perfectly preserved. You would get very upset if Christians went around saying, the text of our Bible has been perfectly preserved, letter for letter, dot for dot, word for word. You would get very upset with that because you'd be like, look, I am aware you have variants, here are your variants. The only difference between that and what you guys are doing is you're saying that theologically it's acceptable because Muhammad supposedly actually said these contradictory things. Isn't that not quite insulting to Muhammad to say that he said things and then immediately said the opposite of things in the same surah, in the same verse, in the same ayah? Like, do you not find that to be not befitting of a prophet? To say, like, to be so two-faced, to say one thing and then to say the other thing that is the exact opposite in meaning? We could go on and on and on about how the Quran is imperfectly preserved. This is just one of the examples, looking at the killer art. The Aruf is another kettle of fish because the Aruf appears to be lost as far as I'm, I'm concerned. If it hasn't been, I challenge Muslims like Musa Adnan to show me the seven different Aruf. I get the impression I'll be waiting for a long time though because I don't think it exists. If it doesn't, that means that potentially up to six out of seven different valid recitations have been lost. Keep in mind, the ten different recitations were never always known in the Muslim community. For a while it was considered they were just seven. Before that there wasn't even any acknowledgement that there were seven. It was Ibn Mujahid who standardized the idea that there were seven different canonized readings of the Qur'at. Again, the Qur'at went through a canonization process and many different Qur'at 
are not considered valid. They were excluded. So it's not as if there was only ever seven and then somehow that changed into ten. There were tons of these. There were tons of these that were being recited in the Muslim Ummah that people thought were valid. They were being said in mosques as part of the prayers. But eventually it was standardized that only seven were allowed. And then eventually even that had to change later on, centuries later, to become ten. This is long after Muhammad is gone. Muhammad never gave the thumbs up to this, to this kind of canonization process. So when a Muslim da'i tells you the Quran has been perfectly preserved, Ask him what perfect means. If he's being honest with you, he'll have to have a very low opinion of the word perfect. And he'll have to say, look, it means that there's many different recitations, but we think they all go to Muhammad. And yes, we think that Muhammad said contradictory things. If he's not being honest to you, he's going to say that the perfect preservation means a single Quran that has not had any changes, additions, or anything ever since Muhammad revealed it. That's a lie, because Muhammad revealed more than one recitation. And the fact they don't mention that to you is proof of the fact they want to keep you in ignorance. Don't let Muslim da'is do this to you. Learn and read for yourself and come up with your own conclusions about whether the doctrine of perfect preservation is true or not. I have no doubt that it isn't. I think you can argue for functions or methods of preservation, but you can't argue for perfect preservation. Even Dr. Haitham Sidki, when he was interviewed by Blogging Theology, Paul Williams' website, when having a dialogue with Paul Williams, he described the idea that there's only one recitation of the Quran that's been perfectly preserved as a children's story. Because scholars know this, and if they're free to be a little bit critical, they'll be like, look, guys, it's not true. You might want it to be true, but it just isn't. Quran scholar says, one Quran is like lying to children. Many people, mo maybe most, I don't know, many Muslims grow up not knowing anything outside of the Hafs tradition. And they don't get exposed to the idea that there are other reading traditions and that there are Quranic variants and that all sort of this whole system framework that I discussed. And it might be surprising to some people, but um, and unfortunately, actually, so I have heard some preachers that, that do say that there's only, you know, one reading or one Quran or, or something like that. And, um, you know, if I were to be very generous, I, I would say that that falls under the umbrella of like lies to children, if that makes sense. So lies to children, lies to children. Um, argue for preservation. Don't argue for perfect preservation. That is a big dumb dumb idea. Be clever. Understand that human beings make errors and variants happen in manuscripts. Understand that committees have to be formed to try to figure out what those variants were and which are valid and which are not valid. And then hopefully you'll understand exactly why Christian perspective on preservation is far superior to the Islamic perspective. The Christian understanding of preservation is preservation of the meaning through the text not preservation of a letter-for-letter, word-for-word, dot-for-dot text. And yet Muslim missionaries, Muslim days will keep telling people this because it keeps them in ignorance. But yeah, seriously consider whether or not you should even be a Muslim. There's no historical claim that Islam has over Isa. There is none, and scholars will tell you that. Whereas in Christianity, because we accept the earliest and the multiply independently attested manuscripts for the sayings of Jesus, we actually have a claim of historicity. So for us, we're interested in the historical Jesus. Who was he and what did he actually teach and what did he actually do? In Islam, it's just someone's supposed revelation of it. But that can't be validated. In fact, it actually goes against everything we know historically about Jesus. And if you do love the prophets, including Isa, then why not look at what the earliest people had to say about who Isa was? The Quran affirms the disciples as valid companions of Isa. The Quran even says that they declared that they are Muslim. If they are Muslim and they're a disciple, why not? Why not look at what they wrote? Why not look about what people who studied under them wrote? Why not apply the science of the Isnad to the Christian perspective and see what you get there? And I think you'll get a much better answer and a much more consistent answer. And hopefully it'll lead you to some truth. But God bless you all. I hope you had a great day. That includes you, Musa Adnan. God bless you all. Have a great day. Take care.